psychogeography to me is how place makes you feel. And the drift and all these other terms is like, that's wandering around and noting down how a place makes you feel. And I kind of had a much more simplistic, primal need to write about place. One of the things I was always trying to do, I always try and do the book, is I'm trying to create a sort of this haunted space and this folkloric space where when you wander it, you will find out what your passions are, what really haunts you, what, what your triggers are, what the psychic landmines that you walk on in Hookland that tell you something about yourself. So in every village, every town, there is a house that is haunted, that is the equivalent of the monster house, which is a bit weird and a bit different, that has a, has, has a, a feeling of darkness, which you project onto it. There are, the, whether it's the overflow pipe or whether it's the, the, the underpass or the railway bridge, there are these places where stories are projected upon. They gather and, and they sort of soak into them. And you experience all of that as a child in a, in, a, in a sense of wonder and enchantment and quite often absolute terror. I got, I got a lifetime ban at the age of seven for, from the local church for necromancy. Welcome to the Spirit Box podcast, where we explore mysticism, esoterica, and the world of the spirits and everything in between. As some of you know, I'll be speaking at Avalon Con this summer, and I'm really pleased to to say that as part of um, my appearance at Avalon Con, uh, I'll be interviewing a lot of the guests between now and the event. And today, I'm happy to welcome the first of those guests, and it's a real treat. It was I really really enjoyed this show. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to the Spirit Box author, landscape punk, and creator of Hookland, Mr. David Southwell. This was a fascinating conversation, and as I said, one I greatly enjoyed. David traced the origins of Hookland back to a cab ride he shared with J.G. Ballard. And true to the concept of providing a magical perspective on the landscape as part of re-enchantment, we also discussed Hookland's function as resistance to the fascist claims on folklore. From there, we go to David's childhood growing up in Essex, being a seven-year-old necromancer, which I think is one of the most awesome things I've heard on this show today. It was an incredible achievement as a seven-year-old. And we go on to the Southern TV interruption incident in 1977. Some really, really great stuff, really interesting takes on on, on that event and, and the subsequent ideas of, of, of magic in local areas and what it means to be specific and tailored to to a locality and a really really interesting um framework that that uh, that david has built through hookland in the plus show we discussed the osborne supernatural books that uh, turns out had a big influence on us both and um we discussed the haunted hotel in glastonbury where a lot of the avalon guests are staying and we touched on david's time as an end of peer fortune teller discuss classism in the occult and and much more if you want to hear the plus show then sign up to the patreon and you'll get the plus show along with a host of other benefits to that end if you like the spirit box and want to support it in some way then there's a number of ways you can do so there's patreon which i've already mentioned or you can hit the paypal link on every youtube video and in my link tree I'm always interested in people's experiences with the other, from hauntings to shadow people. So if you have a story to tell, reach out to me, either on Patreon, Twitter, or on Insta. Okay, let's get on with the show. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. David Southwell to the Spirit Box. David, you're hugely welcome. And um, thank you. It's a huge honor to be here. Oh, well, I, the honor is all mine. Absolutely. And um, I, I think actually to, to, to set the scene for people, um, there's a couple of things that I, I'm really excited to talk to you about. So first off, we're both going to be talking at Avalon Con in, in the summer. So we can, really I, 
that we can actually have these conversations in the pub and that's actually that's probably what we should do at some stage because we were talking about kind of this pub conversation and podcasts and all that kind of stuff well let's let's get one booked in where we can actually do this properly over pints and um oh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll get that in, in uh in um in for glastonbury um but the other bit I wanted to ask you about is obviously Hookland and psychogeography and this really intriguing um, just whole landscape that you've created. Um, this this folkloric landscape, this this misty England full of tales, full of dangerous woods and humming pylons and that before I, I, as I was saying to you before, before we hit record, I saw this for so long in my Twitter feed, and I just for ages going, "What the hell is Hookland? What is this?" And it completely baffled me. And seeing so many people that I, I kind of, you know, I, I knew through through various different groups feed into it and, and and doing kind of, you know, Marco doing music about it and Phil kind of retweeting uh, about it I just being really baffled you know what is this and and kind of following it just to go to try and engage with it and, and understand it and, and kind of learn more and, and 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 I kind of wanted to ask you like what is the where, where, where did it come from you know um and what 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 drives it because it is it, beautiful really it, it comes from it comes from several different places one of them was, um, I used to write lots of awful books um, on true crime and conspiracies, and I used to do a lot of ghost writing. Um, and I, I used to also be a spin doctor for evil corporations. And I used to be on the BBC a lot. And I was at the BBC you know, TV centre as was um, at White City. And they'd had JG Ballard on as well in the morning. And so I was down in the lobby and there was J.G. Ballard about to get into his cab. So I told a huge fib saying, oh, well, I'm, can I catch the cab with you? Mine hasn't turned up um, and I'm going in the same direction. And I was completely the other side of London. And so I had this wonderful car ride in, in, a, in a BBC sort of car going over the, the Westway and we were discussing um, which bits of the Westway, were, which gangster was buried in the concrete and and he was pointing out which bit of the Westway was his, where crash had happened. And we we're having this fantastic conversation. I needed somebody whose books I'd, I'd grown up reading. And I sort of said, oh, well, I, I read this one at this age. And he said, oh, you should never have read it that young. What was the librarian thinking of giving it to you? And we we're having a, a, you know, a really lovely conversation. But you, you say, well, you ask for advice because it's, you know, somebody that you hugely admire as a writer. And he said, well, you, you know, just concentrate on place nothing without a sense of place is ever any good and that for me was this real switch off moment of can't keep on turning out this pack work and i have to concentrate on place and when you start writing about place you sort of you start rubbing up against psychogeography and i very quickly discovered that for me i didn't i loved a lot of the concepts in psychogeography but I didn't like the way psychogeography, if I talked about ghosts or temple shades or spirits of place, to a psycho geographic audience, or a lot of the psychogeographic audience, they were saying, well, that, you're, 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 you're being ironic. It's an art language, you know? It, it, and it was like, no, I'm, I'm talking about actual spirits of place. I'm talking about actual ghosts. And you get the queer looks. And, and a lot of psychogeography was very academic, and it was very much cliquey and it was an art language of exclusion and it sort of fetishized walking or wild swimming it it really also didn't seem to respect a lot of the time just being in a place and experiencing a place it was about the journey and about the travel and it, I, I i found a lot of it sort of i'm from essex and and you know I, and therefore i'm quite a simple man and you know it you look at psychogeography and as in my simple Essex way, psychogeography to me is how place makes you feel. And the drift and all these other terms is like, that's wandering around and noting down how a place makes you feel. And I 
kind of had a much more simplistic primal need to write about place and so one of the reasons for doing Hookland was like well if I do a psychogeography of a place that doesn't exist nobody can interpret it for me and tell me well I'm being ironic I'm you're, you're, you're this this is reminiscent of this really I was like no I, you know this is the only way I can talk about it and it can be my form of what I used to call psychogeography now what I would call landscape punk which is to to talk about place without having to put a theory in front of it because a lot of psychogeography is very academic and it sort of requires a theory to be ahead of place and I just wanted a, a primacy of place so in, in some ways it was me being going well, okay I'm going to create my version of this so I can talk about ghosts and spirits of place and how place makes me feel without having to go for all of the pontry of you know theory um another big thing was it was about 2012 um and there was something in the air about the way the national conversation was going that it was becoming a lot more right-wing and a lot more racist and frankly a lot more terrifying and i know how folklore is always something the far right wants to squat it wants to own um it, it's and i thought if I'm squatting on that landscape in some way, it makes it much more difficult for them to take it. And I think two of the key things that sort of kicked it off was a friend who was living in Avery rang me uh, for some advice on uh, something. And it, it was, they were sort of walking around the stones and the conversation was being disrupted by the fact that somebody from the BMP was being led around Avery in the stones on a white horse in, in shining armor. And I was like, well, you know, you should be protesting against that. You should be disrupting that. Why are you just accepting that as normal? You know, and it was like, well, hold on. You know, if, if I, I, I can't complain about other people, you know, accepting, you know, the squatting of folklore and that commonwealth of folklore by the far right if I'm not doing something myself. So Hawkland was always envisioned as being part of that. Um, and, and this idea was... Yeah, this idea right from the start was Hookland was going to be about re-enchantment and a way of you know trying to sort of edit back some of the strangeness that had been in my childhood and I'd seen sort of seep out of popular culture and uh, try and provide a sort of a magical perspective on landscape and folklore and things which were very important to me um, but in a way that it couldn't be co-opted or weaponized by the light and would be in direct opposition to the far right. So it was me coming into that space saying, well, I'm gonna make it much more difficult for you. And I've tried to do that by starting folklore with fascism. But I've also, right from the start, that has been a big inspiration behind Auckland, was just to make it much more difficult for all of the blood and soil nationalists, all the ethno-state numpties to sort of own folklore because that's what they always try and do. So this was like, yeah, I'll create something which you can't own um and sign which is going to be shared by everybody and is going to be aggressively very anti-fascist um because i felt there was a need for that um and you know it, it, hookland has always had those sort of agendas in it um and but it also comes from sort of deep joy of you know i love folklore i love places i love talking about them I love writing about them. That's what I do. And I wanted to have something where I, another big part of it was I'm, I'm very convinced that writers are really good at creating worlds, but we're not very good at being landlords. And the traditional sort of way of, of you know, for a lot of writers is you write something and then you have to police it. You have to police the copyright. If people love the world you've created, you know, you're turfing them out at the end of the book, at the end of the project. It's like, well, you, you, yeah, we, I don't really want fan fiction. I don't want you, you know, taking any bits of this and using it for yourself. Or I don't want you living in that space I've created. And I thought, I just don't want to be a landlord. And I, I, I think it's an, that landlord obsession that a lot of writers have and a lot of publishers want us to have can be really unhealthy. So I wanted to do something where, right, from the start, 
it was owned by everybody who needed it or wanted it. Um, and it was going to be a community. It was going to be something where um, there wasn't going to be copyright police on you unless you were misogynistic, unless you were homophobic, unless you were fascist. It's yours to use to do whatever you want with. Um, I'd much rather get on with the creating and the sharing rather than the policing and being a landlord. And it was, you know, very much a stance against the anti-commodification of folklore in many ways. Um, and, 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 and because of some of the things I write about, it was also it was an, an anti-commodification of magic and of, of the enchanting. And, you know, it's the same, well, the end output of this doesn't have to be me, you know, writing a book and creating a ring fenced area of, of knowledge. It, it's that sound that, you know, struck me as there's an awful lot of people doing that. If I wanted to do something different and something which, you know, worked for me, I needed to do it in quite a different way. And so I think those have always been agendas underpinning Hookland, you know. Um, and I get that in many ways, Hookland is quite confusing because Twitter is very fragmentary. And I've always said that I, I, I absolutely trust my audience to stitch it all together, you know, to, you know, it's a, it's a big, massive thousand piece jigsaw and for them to start putting it together and to make Hawkland into the picture that works for them. Um, and and it, I quite, I realized quite, quite often it takes you, you know, you, you have to kind of stick with the feed and you go, okay, I, I recognize this voice. And I recognize this subject that's being talked about or this place that's being talked about or I, you know, and it, it, it does also, I, I, I kind of trusted that people would be intrigued. Um, people would put it together themselves and I didn't have to spoon feed people and I could trust people to be much smarter than I was and to find their own narratives. So it can be, I, I absolutely accept, it can be seen as quite confusing, quite baffling. It's not deliberately, you know, obscure. Mm. It's just, you know, if you stick with it for a bit, it, you're either going to get it or you're not going to get it. And but it's that, okay that, if you don't that, get it. But, but that for me, though, is that's the bit that kind of when it finally dropped, I was like, that's brilliant. Like, I love the fact that it created it. It's in itself its own folklore. And in, but it's used Twitter in this kind of decentralized way, and you've you've got different players, and and then the curation around the different players pulling it all together. Um, it, it, yeah, and I it was exciting, really. I think that's the thing for me is that I it, I found it really intriguing because you're talking about subjects that I would love anyway, you know, um, and and I and I really respect that that you know, that in there you're looking at this as an art piece to decouple, you know, um, like the, 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 the far right away from the claim on, on, on folklore. I think that's, that's, that's an awesome endeavor as well. And I love that you're using art to do that. Um, but it's, yeah, I think, I think for me really looking at it is just kind of understanding that I've been led on this kind of merry tale that this kind of, Pied Piper of folklore through Twitter has got so many layers to it that um, I like it, it's yeah I just I just found it really charming beyond anything else beyond the cleverness of it I found it really kind of I enjoyed the fact that I've been kind of led on a, on kind of like a it's that uh, thread it's, through it's the really, forest you know it's really kind of you to say that I think one of the things I it's also it's really sweet and that, that means a lot because one of the things I was always trying to do, I always try and do with Hookland, is I'm trying to create a sort of this haunted space and this folkloric space where when you wander it, you will find out what your passions are, what really haunts you, what, what your triggers are, what the psychic landmines that you walk on in Hookland that tell you something about yourself and the stories that resonate with you and the bits of folklore that resonate with you. And you find your own terrors and it's designed to be something that one I and others put it out there. It's about, it's as much about your response to it as it is about, you know, 
the text or the piece of music. It, it's about that your response to that is absolutely valid. And hopefully you learn something. You, it sends you down a rabbit hole looking at this piece of folklore, this piece of folklore. It tells you, it puts you in contact with something which haunted you in your childhood and go, yeah, that's still, that's still raw. That's still a painful wound. You know, so it it is like what you, what intrigues you, you know, what touches you, uh, at sort of that psychic landmine level when you're wandering the territory. Um, so to hear that sort of response, that that means a lot. Thank you, Dal. It really does. That's yeah. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. You know, um, and um, you know. It's. I I think the thing, for me that 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 kind of really resonated. Like again, once I got it, I was slow out of the blocks. Um, you know, it is, it's just the art for art's sake. I think that's wonderful. You know, I I genuinely do, and I think like there's there's so many there's so many kind of. <sighs> I mean, ultimately, commercialization of every experience you have, everything you want to do. There, there, there's always kind of like a, a, like a, a dollar sign at the end of it. Yeah. And this, this isn't. It just takes you on this journey, you know. And I think that's enchantment in itself, you know. Um, there, there's a lot of it comes from. I wanted to do something where, because I saw a lot of folklore being commodified, mm -hmm. and a lot of. A lot of things I cared about were being just turned into dollar signs, um, and and I can't rail against that unless I can say, well, there's maybe a different model. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's it's one of the things. I mean, I I see it a lot on a cult Twitter, and, and certainly, you know, you know, it's it's this idea of you you're trying to build up a big enough reputation and and, and prove your intellectual your authentic claims but just to the point that you can sustain a patron mm. or there's a book in it yeah and it's like that's not why i, I ever got into magic that's mm. not my view of a spirituality and but i'm not decrying that model if that's what works for you and that and it works for other people fine but if i'm going to say well, there's got to be a different way I've at least got to explore different ways. And Hawkland is me at least trying to explore different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always, with, with Hawkland, the point of principle is to try and make it as free as possible, as accessible as possible. If there are, if, if you know, I sell something or somebody else sells something, it, it's like but the core of Hawkland, all of that you need in Hawkland, that's always going to be free. It has to be free. Mm -hmm. um it, it it's belongs to the community of people that read it use it want it need it um and i deliberately probably maybe even awake in some ways too much have every chance i've had to commodify hookland i've always tried to pull back mm -hmm. and because i didn't i didn't want to ever create a two-tier system where you have to buy something to get the full hookland experience because hookland is as you say it's it's there, it's open, it's free. And those are its values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have, you, you've got to live the values of, of, you know, of it. And I didn't want it to be a, some sort of grift. And so much of the things I love and I wish I could get more into, that sense of it is a grift, that it's all aiming towards a book. It's all aiming to, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, subscriptions and Patreons. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, nah, not for me. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's something about that whole commodification of knowledge and folklore and spirituality to the extent where that I can't, you know, quite often you see in very interesting projects, but you go, yeah, but this is just, this is just about the book. It's just about getting up, you know, the figures up and the traction until it become a book or a patch mm -hmm. or something. And it's like, and there's some fant and I'm, I don't want to suggest there are some fantastic people that have got patrons and are doing books and it's like that's great and that's that's absolutely how it should be but it doesn't always have to be that way there have to be mm -hmm. other models other ways of doing it and not every project needs to be a book not every project needs to be a kickstarter or a dollar goal mm -hmm. um 
and then, and this was me trying to say, well, look, here's a project which hasn't got a dollar goal, which mm -hmm. is not necessarily going to be things you can buy, um, you know, and uh, I try to embed that as 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 part of the value of the of of Hookland, um, you know, and I'll stick to that, and um, yeah. you know, probably much to the to the annoyance of some people, but uh, it's like, yeah, it, yeah, it is what it is, you know, it's free and um, it's meant to be free and it's meant to be accessible and it's meant to have a different model to then you know this is something you can buy mm -hmm. you already own it you don't need to buy it you don't need to you know you know if somebody wants to you know hit a paypal link and make a donation lovely but they don't have to they really don't have to there's no you know i i i i, I don't you know it's, it's never been about that it has been about the things it was always about which was being you know being a presence on the commonwealth of the imagination right being anti-fascist being able to explore folklore and place mm -hmm. um trying to create a community for people that were interested in those things mm -hmm. and it's that's what it's there for you know and um it, it, yeah it, it was there was never an idea this should be a book this should be something it's like yeah mm -hmm. it's hookland it, it's it's its own strange odd thing yeah, and it's yeah. actually it becomes sometimes quite difficult to explain, you know, quite what it is because it is quite nebulous. But it was designed to be quite nebulous. You know? Yeah, and and that I, I said that that bit for me was was the really beautiful part. I like um because I I love the fact that um it just kind of teased me for ages. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, just kind of like, you know, showing me glimmers of, of 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 itself, you know, until it kind of, you know, you get that kind of, oh right, okay, and then uh, yeah. you know, I just just I just found it um really just fun more than anything else as well. I just really enjoyed that. Um, oh, thank you. But yeah, I I, I, I do realise it can seem quite random because we'll we'll move from, you know, the ghosts of Soviet cosmonauts to mm. you know pylon cults to talking about fairies in the Victorian period and it and it and it, and it jumps all over the place mm. because one of the beauties of it for me is uh, as a writer quite often you have all these different voices in your head mm -hmm. and if you do a, a single work quite often you have to stay in a set number of voices but this is a whole county of people so I'm, I'm sort of quantum leap jumping between the voices and it's quite liberating for me to be able to do that and and i it's also designed also to be that if anybody else wants to create within it you find your voice jump in mm -hmm. create your you know it, it's it's the liberation i have found in being able to create hookland and use hookland i've tried to embed that so other people writing it or making music from it or they've got the same freedoms i have you know that it, it, it is very mutable uh, it's open to an incredible range of voices. It's not even set in one time period. You can, you know, it, and it's like, yep, yeah, it, it's flexible. Um, and, and and some of the things that people have done with it are things I would never have done with it at all. Certainly beyond me. Uh, you know, my aim has always been it's it, it's ridiculous at some levels. But Hookland to me is an active act of enchantment. Yeah. And it that's that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to enchant. I'm trying to give people a different perspective, different eyes, new eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, you the eyes wander in many ways. So it's an act of enchantment. And some of the bits that other people have done which have worked for me have also, I would say, have got that enchanting quality that have made me go, oh, that's it. It's just yeah, I never would have got there. I never would have seen this. This mm. is a fantastic perspective. Um, so I, I'm delighted when people use it because that surprises me. That enchants me, right. and it has been an active, you know, act of magical enchantment for me. That's the, mm. you know, so again, it's it's embedded from the first. When I was thinking, well, what is how is this going to be qualitatively different to other things I've done? And it is, and then just the key thing for me was saying. Well, I want to do an active enchantment. I want to edit back in all of the high strangeness that there was certainly was in sort of the uh, the public domain in, in, when I was growing up. I want to put all of that back in. And I want to create a, a sense of enchantment which bleeds from this project into people's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so if you look at your local folklore, 
you'll look at your local stories and maybe Hookland becomes a lens for you doing that or an incentive to do that or it pushes you down a rabbit hole of your own research mm -hmm. but it was to sort of get people back into looking at folklore and looking at their their places and the stories that they heard and um i, I think when i was starting this and it was an idea that just stated for a couple of years um one of the things i really quite disliked at the time was creepy pasta um you know the idea oh, yeah, that, you know, i remember you, that yeah you get the same slender man story and it could be in the ukraine or texas or stafford and you get the same story of dark-eyed children and when i was growing up yeah, every little village every little place had its own little cycle of folklore and you'd go two miles down the road and it was a completely different set of stories mm -hmm. and it was hyper local and and I was thinking, all this creepy pasta, which erases context and erases locality. And I was thinking, well, I want to do something which is a kick against that. Um, and I, one of the things I was trying to do was is, is take folklore and things which had had a big impact on me. And instead of sort of, you, we get to the thing of, Quite often, we're you know unless we provide the context of place and history and culture for a piece of folklore, it, it diminishes it. Right. So I was, I I tried to look at the things instead of talking about a particular sea serpent, I would like create my own sea serpent, but based on the feeling that that had inspired in me as a child, or to fill that environmental niche of folklore, um, but to do something which wasn't just lifting bits of folklore from various places and making a hodgepodge. It was more for me to go, well, why does that need exist? Why do we have sea serpents? Why, you know, why do fairies do this? What, what's going on? And to explore those sort of you know, the environmental niches of folklore and to go, well, there should be something here. And, you know, create those things in, in Hopland um, without ever lobbing the original material of its context, its history, its culture. So quite often people say, well, where does this come from? Well, I'm always very happy to say, well, this was partly inspired by this from Essex and this from Cornwall, because those were the two places I bounced around as a child. And it, this is where it comes from. Go and look at the stuff. It's always going to be better than what I do. But it's those niches, you know, um, that I'm trying to fill in Hookland. And it, it's been a, a burning experience for me because when you think I, I want to tell a story about fairies and what were fairies and, and, and how, how were they presented when I was growing up and how did they make me feel and, and what's that ecological niche in folklore for the fae and the enfolding world of fairy and how does that impact and what does it do um, and what role does it perform in communities and you start thinking about this and that then inspires the stories and um, so I often say you know and it, nothing in Hawkins made up it's just misremembered or remembered differently and i think about you know yeah, what would be in that landscape and then that pushes me back to the source materials and, and the relationships i had with that um when i was first reading about it or first hearing about it um so it, it although it's a work of fiction it it's virtually maps the folklore i've encountered in my life and, and the folklore that most intrigues me and, and you know, most moves me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, for, it, it quite often it, it's folklore is a feeling. I mean, we, we, I think we've been very conditioned to think about folklore as the sing books and this acquisition of knowledge and of theory. And we don't concentrate enough on how folklore makes us feel. Um, and you know, and that, that the range of feelings is everything from comfort to terror um, to a sense of history. All of the, you know, you, we get a lot of deep feelings from folklore. And very much in, in Hookland is trying to do folklore as a feeling, not just folklore as, you know, and it's, you know, telling you what I already, what, uh, what I've learned, what I've read in books. It's trying to connect you back with some of the feelings of folklore. Um, 
Yeah, it, it's when I was growing up, uh, the idea of shooks of the black dogs was, was very, very big. Mm. And this, this idea that there were, there were certain tracks that they particularly favoured going down and there were certain times of day that you would see them. And they were this absolutely terrifying presence to a child, you know, the, the bits of the haunted landscape. Um, you know, and it's, it's like, well, that to me is, is key to try and reproduce in Brooklyn more than produce just regurgitating lots of information about shocks and, and the black dog legends that, yeah, everybody kind of knows. Right? So I take it that if you're very interested in that, you'll go away and read books on it and you'll do your own study. But I'm trying to connect you to how, how, does, how does a shook make you feel? Maybe as a child or when you go back into that landscape as an adult and you remember how terrified and, you know, how you would absolutely try and get home before dark, before it came, because this was the only path along the field and it was meant to be a short path. And so, you, you know, literally would try and tear home, especially in winter before it got dark. And recapturing some of those feelings of folklore you spoke in me, I think is as much in, as important as, yeah, expanding on the theories and the, you know, cherry picking all of the nice little stories and facts if that it, makes sense yeah it, it it does make sense and and it's it's really interesting that you say that you know because you're you're bringing me back to my own childhood really and and thinking about those spaces that had some kind of supernatural danger attached to them or um mystery and and specifically places, but also the interesting bit now that I kind of think about it and kind of, you know, then looking back, really looking back at it, well, when I was a kid, there was an overflow pipe near my house. It was kind of over the wall into the fields, out of the estate, and then there was an overflow pipe and it had some bars in it and then kind of like, you know, bars in front of it so you couldn't get into it. They were kind of bent. bent. And that space to me, what you know getting in there and into the pipe never went in but it was always you know this is way before i could see i had seen any horror films or anything but it was always in the back of my mind and kids talked about there's something in there that there was an abode in there you know that there was something in there that would snatch a child there was jenny green teeth or whatever the equivalent was was in there and 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 that that child folklore uh, of that sense of horror. I mean, it's actually happening now. You're, you're, you, how you're describing this is bringing me into my own hookland, you know? Um, and like that whole, that whole space, you know, it, it, it did end up coming out in, in, in a story that I wrote like 30 years later, but it's, it's interesting that those places and the childhood view you have of them, be they ones that you've constructed with your, 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 your childhood peers and friends or the stories that you you've heard from, you know, parents who want to keep you away from a clearly dangerous overflow tunnel, you know, uh, like it stays with you. It's really interesting. That's well, right back there. Well, you, 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 that whole realm and I think it's under talked about of what I call parental snare law, where, you know, to get you to stay away from places, they invent the stories that are meant to terrify you, mm. you know? And so you, you, when, as a child, there was vast amounts of this parental scare law, but also there's this folklore is the currency of the playground. As much as folklore is the currency of the pub and the post mm. office queue, for kids, it's the currency of the playground where you are telling terrifying stories and repeating the urban legends. And they're in every village, every town, there is a house that is haunted, that is the equivalent of the monster house, which is a bit weird and a bit different, that has a, has, has a, a feeling of darkness, which you project onto it. There are, whether it's the overflow pipe or whether it's the, the, the underpass or the railway bridge, there are these places where stories are projected upon. They gather and, and they sort of soak into them. And you experience all of that as a child in a, in, a, in a sense of wonder and enchantment and quite often absolute terror. Mm. And that, that to me was like, well, I want Hookland to be that bridge back to how you felt as a child. 
and how folklore often works as a child. Um, because quite often, I think in our, our you know, to take a very adult sort of view of folklore, quite often robs it of a lot of that power um, and a lot of its mystery. Um, and, and I think there was another aspect of it, which was, I think um, I was out in the war, the Yugoslav Wars of Dissolution in a journalistic capacity. And I think it was there, I think my folklore got radicalized because I, I, I spent my spare time during the period I was there, sort of trying to collect vampire and shamanic stories about the Shrigan and the curse. I was collecting, trying to collect all of this folklore. Um, but what I also began to see was the importance of folklore, um, you know, the rituals, the superstitions. It was not only sort of this community glue, but it had to deliver something to the people to survive generation after generation, to make those generational leaps. But also during, you know, a period of absolute horror, which war was, you know, the, the fact that, you know, the folklore gave comfort, folklore was delivering. Um, and folklore was not this thing that was sort of about ink stasis in books and, you know, this commodified knowledge and this, you know, stacks of knowledge. It was a living vital force. And I saw that, um, you know, in Yugoslavia and certainly in Croatia and Serbia. I saw just how powerful it was, how living it was, and what, how it sort of was delivering needs that I had sort of almost glossed over, hadn't ever really considered. I'd always been interested in folklore, I was fascinated by it, collected it, um, but I hadn't really seen it as this vital living force. And once you do, you have to go, well, okay, how am I gonna dance with that going forward? This is a living thing, this is, you know, this is a, I can't just let it be books and I just can't let it be an acquisition of knowledge um, and theory. It, it's a living vital force and I've got, to, I've got to make some accommodation with that and I've got to make a response to that. And I, hopefully that's in Hookland as well because yeah, it, 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 for me it was a very, yeah, very different take on folklore. My folklore, you know, which had been you know, quite a sort of, you know, I love reading books about it. I was collecting the stories whilst I was there. But suddenly I was seeing it as something so much more powerful and something I had to respond to and had to find different responses to because I couldn't then just sort of, yeah, let it be this sort of, you know, pin butterfly in a book, this dead thing. You know, it, it was vital and living. And, you know, I try and put that in a sense of that into Hawkland, that we shouldn't treat folklore as this static, you know, piece of knowledge, um, this finite piece of knowledge. It, it, it's a mutational living and very, you know, it, it, it does important things to us as communities, as individuals. And those things are worth looking at, you know, um, and are things I try and explore in Hawkland. And, and, and can we, when you define it that way, you know, it's really easy to see the importance of why, you know, it, it, you, you need to have a pushback against, um, against kind of the idea of fascist ownership of, of folklore, as you described uh, at the start of the show, because, you know, it, it's how folklore defines an area and defines a people in that area. You know, it, 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 you're absolutely right. I, I, I see the, the, the truth of that. Makes sense. And, 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 and fascists always want gravitas mm -hmm. and, and a, a sense of history and a sense of always having been there. Mm -hmm. And one of the easiest shortcuts for them has always been folklore. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can claim the stories of the land, I claim the land. Yeah. I claim the, you know, and, and if I can claim that psychic territory, if I can have some ownership of that, if I can, if I can ring fences and say this is a race thing, this is a nationalist thing, this, you cannot have this, you cannot, which is absolute ridiculousness of the first order. Um, you know, the indigenous Britons are under the waves of Doggerland. You know, folklore walks, it it it, it travels, it blurs, it mutates. You know, it, it it's a constantly changing thing. Yeah. But it, it's it's a very powerful force, and just you know. 
looking at it as, as, as something which is cute and entertaining and 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 and, and just for the fiction mill and, and and what i call sort of folklore as tinsel you know right. it's, it's, it's pretty and it's nice and it's interesting but it's not important folklore is the infrastructure of so of what makes communities what communities it, it, it has such an impact on us as individuals um that it is a vital force and i think it needs more attention yeah i yeah owen davis the great sort of folklore academic recently said folklore should be being taught in schools and he's absolutely right folklore should be part of any national curriculum not mm -hmm. least of which to stop the fascists coming in and owning it and weaponizing it and trying to turn it into something which it really isn't mm -hmm. um and, and if you give children sort of that sense of it at an early age and and the joy and give them the joy of it yeah you know that would be a fantastic way of keeping the fascists out but, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I had a, I came back from, uh, Croatia and Serbia with a very different view of what folklore was and what it meant and, and as a living force. And I, and I came back and I looked at my own landscape and I saw it very differently and I had very, very different responses to it post mm -hmm. that. And, um, and I, I think, yeah, for me, it was, a, it was a, not just a moment of political rad radicalization of folklore. But of a huge sense of change in my approach to it and my folkloric practice um and whereas i'd been collecting folklore and recording interviews and and and, and it was just like well it, it, it makes a page or it's on a cassette and I've, I've captured it and so it won't become extinct but actually if it's just trapped in a magnetic field on a cassette recorder or it's you've just written it up as an article or you, you know, you've made it, you put it on, you, you put a thousand words of it into a newspaper. It's not necessarily folklore living and it's not necessarily an adequate response to its grandeur and power just to go, yeah, I'm just going to catalog it. Yeah. I, I, I kind of moved away from viewing one of those people that just wanted to catalog stories to, actually learn from them and be part of them mm -hmm. and let them seep into me and change me and i think it was a yeah it, and that that certainly came from my experiences um in the former yugoslavia uh, it was a very very different approach to folklore which i saw there which i hadn't really seen um certainly not in the late 80s early 90s in england and in the way it was lived the importance of it and and it, and it there's a huge change in my perspective and perception of it. Right. And and in terms of your own your own journey, I mean, you described that 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 period where, where you were in uh, the, the 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 former Yugoslavia before it broke up into 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 the oh. separate states. Yeah. Um, but say we go back further to to your own childhood growing up in Essex yeah. you know what what experiences did you have there that set you down this path I, I, I think part of it is, is Essex is a very uh, just looking forward to a brilliant book by Alex Langstone called The Liminal Shore which is an exploration of Essex folklore and it, it's a fantastic read because he gets the sense of place and, and just how linked the stories and the folklore of Essex is to the the salt marshes, the creeks, the, uh, the fields, that it, it's a fantastic, you know, it brought me back to my childhood because growing up there was, you know, a very, I played as a child in the, the churchyard of the, you know, the last master of witches. Um, you know, the, you, you absolutely had a sense of the cunning folk as a, a palpable force. That you brushed up against you know you you i remember my mother saying well you know if you ever play knockdown ginger don't ever play knockdown ginger on this house because she's cunning and you know it, it won't go well for you <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't just parental skill or that was yeah we all knew yeah if you play knockdown ginger not there not there and we we had that sense you know where i grew up in in essex of you know the little town I was in 
historically had stoned Matthew Hopkins when he turned up to sort of persecute the wow, witches. Yeah. They so loved the cunning folk. They stoned him. They, they just like, no, none of this malarkey here. They stoned him out of it. And good for them. Uh, there was that sort of, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the way you do it in Essex. That's the way you should do it <laughs> anywhere. You've got a witch, a witch kind of turns up. But the, there was that sense of, you know, most of what people say about cunning is intuitive guessing. You know, um, it's not a single strand of belief. You know, nobody can own it. it, it it's, and if you all top it, it will jump off the table and it will spit curses at you. But it was a very palpable sense of it was something which existed. It was something which had existed. It still existed. It was in the landscape. And the other part of that is there was that same sense for witchcraft. But witchcraft was very different to the cunning. Um, you know, it, it, Essex was, you know, witch soaked and it, it was all there, everywhere in the landscape, everywhere had witch stories. But it was that you got that sense that witchcraft was quite different. It was this sublimated shadow. It was the dark urges of old Albion. It was the dark urges of the past. And it kind of bled through into now in all these macabre paperbacks, which as a kid you wanted to read because they were lurid. And, and, and there was also a, a sense of it of, a, of something of suggestive, salty suburban sex to, as a child you weren't quite meant to know about. And that was there. But there was also that sense in the 70s growing up as a kid in Essex of witchcraft had been there and now it was coming back. And all those heirs of Hopkins mm -hmm. should be quaking. Uh, you know, that you know, they've been stoned out once before. And there, so there was that sense of, of witchcraft coming back in Essex in the 70s. Um, as, as you know, and I think we when we deny this, we're lying. There is something a little bit certain of the child, you know, 10, 11, there was something a bit sexy about the sinisterness of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. and that perception of witchcraft. So you grew up, I grew up with all of these stories of cunning. I grew up with all of these stories of, of witchcraft that was there in Essex, it was there in Cornwall, there in other places. It, it was just this wonderful sort of static of, you know, there is a weird, you mm -hmm. know, that there is a weird that can be studied and can be encountered and it has a reality. Um, and so Certainly, in the, and I, I've, I've talked about this quite a bit before, but you know, you, the television news bulletins would, you know, you go from an IRA bombing to talking about a UFO or right. talking about a cryptid. Um, the documentaries on witchcraft, it, it, or if it was on, you know, Nationwide, they could talk about poltergeist for 18 minutes or they could talk about witchcraft, but without a snigger, without that sense of being ironic. Mm -hmm. It was dealt with as quite factual. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, growing up as a child, it was this sense of these things were there to be studied. They had a reality. Um, and, of course, as a kid, they're really, really exciting. And, and you know, I, I, I certainly, growing up, I, I, I really gravitated towards that as a subject. Um, yeah, and, and, and there was also lots of, you know, it, it, it's hard to explain it, but the... Certainly, from my experience of the 1970s as a child, it was a period of absolute high strangeness. So a, a, a lot of the scenarios I, I had as a child where you were experiencing high strangeness, you kind of, it was, you, you treated it as a thing, as, as quite normal. And it, you, it wasn't just this separate area over here. Um, so going back to parental... Scared of. I, mean, I think I first tried to summon the devil when I was four. I, I think my mother, uh, my mother had said, don't take chocolate into the toilet because the devil will appear. It's a, you know, you know, it's the sort of household I was growing up in. So the first thing I did was take chocolate into the toilet to try and get the devil to appear. You know, I, I, nothing, you know, as a four-year-old, this was like... Oh, this was, you know, I had completely the opposite reaction to parental scare law. But, you know, yeah. I didn't actually think that was odd. I mean, looking back at that, I think, I'm not sure every four-year-old is trying to summon the devil. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got a lifetime ban at the age of seven 
for from the local church for necromancy because <laughs> uh, as a single parent family which was more of a rarity in the 70s mm -hmm. we were very poor um you know like we had 30 pounds a week to live on right and i was very much aware of the family poverty so i had read in books about you know summoning up you know the spirits of the graveyard you know, to perform tasks for you and growing up where well, i did you know the local cunning man was the famous cunning moral so one day after school i led 30 children into the the boneyard into the churchyard and got them to perform this you know these necromantic rites because i was trying to summon the spirit of cunning mold to appear so he you know would tell me where treasure was so i could alleviate my family poverty it the ritual i i i i, I can't say it was an effective ritual because about halfway through it the local victor, uh, vicar, a guy called uh, the Reverend Athelstan Morley, who was wow. known as Lurch because he was this huge right. six foot six, six foot eight figure, picked me up by my ear and dragged me out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I got a lifetime ban at seven for necromancy. And you know, oh. I had my revenge on him in, because I've, I've made him a, a character in Hookland. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, so. The, I, I, I'm not sure that I had a typical childhood, but the fact that I could get 30 other children to come and do, you know, you know, summon the dead, etc., I think shows you that it was culturally at that time, it wasn't that odd. It wasn't that strange. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, there was certainly, you know, the childhood esoteric landscape. But I think we, a lot of us were very fascinated by, by this. I think one of the things that, um, you know, my friend Chris Joseph calls them, you know, the gateways into the cult was we had the Osborne Paranormal Guides. Um, I had some of those as well. And yeah, yeah they written. And, 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 and um, yeah. because they were written by Eric Maple, or some of them were written by Eric Maple, mm. they were very ethnic focused. So it was just like this, the, 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 those books were like childhood crap mm. to us. You know, they were, they were the gateway drug into a lot of the paranormal. Um, and it was like, oh, boy, Rectory, that's an essence. We must go there. And so all of, all of this was happening. Um, and I think there was a genuine sense of strangeness pervaded my childhood. Um, I mean, there were, there were things which were quite mm -hmm. odd as well, which when, 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 when you talk about them, people go, oh, that, that didn't happen. Uh, one of the things was we, were, we used to get shipped out between pillar and post family, friends and relatives, and we got sent down to... Hampshire and one once we were down in Hampshire I, I I'd got very into it at that point of trying to summon UFOs with a torch at night yeah and then one Sunday afternoon uh you know, just before the cartoons started there was the news and we we're waiting for the cartoons to come on and it's on a farm in Hampshire and this is known as the southern tv interruption where it's still not known who did it or how it was done but somebody hijacked the news broadcast and decided, this is the voice of Ashalon, uh, the Ashtar Star Command. We are speaking to you. And, and, so, and, and there was a vroom, vroom, like a, like a sort of subsonic, bassy sort of Doctor Who TARDIS sound. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this was going on. And, and, and me and my brother were terrified and fascinated. And I was convinced in my head that I had partly summoned them by, you know, the, using a torch to try and summon the foes. Yeah. And the, the reaction to adults to it was very different to me as a child. This was the most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. um, to the adults, the farmer went around. I, I was taken away from me. I was never allowed to torch. We were never allowed to use, I was never allowed to speak about, say, the word UFO again. And for two weeks, he sort of went around with a shotgun everywhere in case aliens did actually land. Um, and the fact that there was, there was never a satisfactory explanation to it, 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 it whether it was an inside job at Southern Television, whether it was students, who, who had, nobody would ever call. Questions were raised in the House of the Parliament. I think the part of the suggestion of why it was an inside job at Southern Television was the broadcast happened over the news over a Bugs Bunny cartoon, which was Martian. Martian. So there, it, it was just this wonderful, surreal experience mm. of childhood. But again, it kind of convinces you that weird things happen. Mm. Um, and I was talking the, the other day um, to a couple of friends on Twitter 
about number stations and how as a child we used to I used to listen to number stations and I could go into a trance because you'd hear these weird robotic voices just intoning number after number after number yeah and no adult had an explanation of it there was no internet there was no way of going what is this strange thing I'm hearing um coming out of the radiogram and I used to sort of program myself as a child to tend to sort of go into a trance and I was kind of convinced this might be alien somehow speaking over the radio um and 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 and, and so it was like I'd go into these weird chances and I'd say to the aliens I'm really awful at algebra can you make algebra work in my head can can you make, make can you um, give me knowledge of computers and things mm -hmm. and the auto suggestion of that which is clearly is auto suggestion I suddenly got much better at maths. I suddenly got, you know, I understood a lot more about computers and things. And it was like, yeah, this works. This is, this is, this is some sort of weird magic. Um, and and you, you, you kind of, you know, much learning, oh yeah, you know, you, you, you've hypnotized yourself. You've gone into this sort of weird fugue state listening to the number stations. But I was convinced there was some aliens, you know, orbiting around and they were beaming knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know, yeah, as a, the child growing up onto the Doctor Who and lots of Soviet sci-fi and all of this it was very much part of my childhood. This made absolute sense to me, and it was like, yeah, clearly the aliens are speaking to me. Um, well, and at some level, it you know it, it improved my performance at school. You know, I, so I couldn't complain about it. Uh, well, it's interesting that that you kind of mentioned the the Osborne books as well, because um, and I only found this out recently, kind of after that that I. That I sorted it out but the the hotel that um a lot of us are, are kind of booked into um for avalon con george uh, george hotel of pilgrims that one mm -hmm. um it's got a really famous ghost photograph that was taken on the stairs there and um and it's in that osborne book it's i've just connected the two that like that that osborne book I, I had exactly the same one with like three UFOs in the cover. I'm, gonna, I'm sure there was a, like a big foot or something in there. And, and there was this really famous shot of the white lady going up the stairs. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's, that's the place where that photograph was taken. That would be fabulous because that is such a powerful, those books were such a powerful of my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, the one, one of the wonderful things about them is, is it, it, it's kind of, there's no steer in them. Mm -hmm. There's no side, there's no playing it for loss. And it, it also kind of assumes that as a child, you don't need a specific warning about being scared or being frightened. You'll just process this information, make of it as you will, um, which is a wonderfully liberating educational way of talking and passing on information. And but they, those books were absolutely, you, you'd read those little snippets, mm -hmm. which are quite often no more than a, than a tweet in size. Mm. And your mind would just, it was just such a, a growth hormone for the imagination. It was such an engine to push you into thinking about how does telepathy work? How would this work? You know, do UFOs come from the future? You know, why can't you photograph some ghosts? Um, but you can others. And it, all of these wonderful, sort of, it, it, those I think were fantastic to read as, as, as children. I, I, I don't think there is a modern equivalent. I was no, delighted. I don't, think, I don't think there is. I think you're right. You know, I think they've republished some of them. Um, yeah. But even the photography in them, that, that there's that just lovely grainy quality to them. Um, you know, just old black and white stuff. And even the kind of the, the, the kind of the 80s illustrations, just they're just fantastic. They're absolutely fantastic pieces. They, they, they were just, and I, and I remember I, I, I saw my first one with a guy called Mark Lester for like nine plastic power troopers. Um, and it was like, and I got the better deal because that, that book lived with me for years. Um, it, it, it sort of, yeah, it was, uh, they were fantastic. Um, and there isn't a modern equivalent. And uh, a lot of the, I think the entry material now that people are exposed to is, has a very, very different tone. Um, and then, uh, if, you, if you're coming into some of these subjects and your first experience is watching sort of a ghost reality or ghost bro show or mm -hmm. paranormal show. It, 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 it's a very different setup. And I think your expectations and, you know, 
the way it all is, it, those as entry level, those as portals, um, I think were fantastic. And, the, and, it, and it saddens me that there isn't a similar equivalent today. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted to see the republications because they, they, they're still wonderful. They still excite. They still give you tingles. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the nostalgia. It's, they are, you know, it's like, oh, I've not thought about this case for a long while. I'm not, yeah, actually, that's a really good thing. And this has got out of the conversation, but it was part of the assembly. We should be talking about this, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they're fantastic books. And, um, you know, yeah, they, they were a part of childhood as well, part of that, you know, building a, a sense of the esoteric and the strange in your head that you then go on at later points to explore. And you go, this is something I'm interested in. I'm something I, I want to know more about. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they were fantastic for that. Um, and I, but I also think, yeah, childhood spent in, in places like Cornwall and Essex where, you know, it was very much on the surface and, and, and had a reality for, you know, lots of people adults um so it's something that they talked about they knew about and they wanted to impart to you i think also you know you helped give me a very um inquisitive sense of you know yeah this is this is something worth looking at you mm -hmm. know which i didn't lose from my teenage years or from my own years you know but, you know you know the eighteen to one and I, I it was a fascination it was something i, I took seriously uh, i i think also, part of it was um, <laughs> there's an element of when I was growing up in Essex um, and in my teenage years, you know, we also had modern cunning men. They didn't call themselves, one of them would have called himself a modern cunning man. But I, we, I had figures like Andrew Collins and Andrew Chumley, who I knew very well, and you know, you know. To close, um... What I'd like to 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 discuss that the kind of the next time you come on is again your experiences in Paris, but um, to maybe talk a bit more about kind of uh, what your ambitions for for Avalon Con uh, are, you know, uh, for your session, and and then the, the second bit is uh, for people who want to find out more about Hookland and about you. Where's the best place for people to find you? Um, Hookland at the moment lives very much on Twitter. So if you head to Twitter and do at Hookland Guide, you'll find Hookland. Um, it lives on Facebook. I don't do it on Facebook. I'm mm -hmm. very much removed from Facebook. Um, there is a Hookland group on Facebook. But the best place to experience it is um, Twitter. Um, there tends to be longer pieces for Hookland um, I've just finished one for uh, a fanzine called Rituals and Declarations. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And there's, some, you know, there's always, you know, it's, it's an honour to be in there because there's, there's lots of good writing. Um, so they, I'm, this year, I'm very much trying to de spend most of the time death proofing Hookland. So mm -hmm. if anything happens to me, Hookland continues on. And so yeah. there, 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 there will be, hopefully, by the end of the year, more resources, websites and things. But it, it, again, I, Hawkland was sort of like, it doesn't, you know, can I do something on just on Twitter? Um, and pretty much you, the answer is yes. You, you, you mm -hmm. can, t we all get the Twitter we deserve to a certain degree. And if you, and then if you curate for kindness and beauty and poetry and strangeness, you tend to get a lot of that back. So... Yeah, at the moment, it's primarily on Twitter. It will be other places. I'm really grateful when I have opportunities. To, you know, and this, this has been the first podcast I've ever done. And I'm really, thank you so much for having me oh, on, Dara. Oh, thank you for coming on. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm honoured for your first podcast. Oh, it's almost awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, I used to do, a, I'm very rusty, but I used to do a lot of media when I was an awful, evil spin doctor. But I haven't done a podcast. And uh, this is the first one I've done. And it's lovely to be able to come on and talk about Hookland. Um, and I'm really grateful when I get those opportunities like Avalon Com and Marco to say, well, yeah, come and talk about Hookland and talk yeah. about the various things behind it because it, it, it's nice to take it off of Twitter for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's, you know, it's like, I, yeah, I, I, it's, it's nice to have other ways to manifest it. Um, 
and so yeah hopefully uh yeah people will in i know i i'm you know so i'm really chuffed to be uh, asked to be at avalon con because you look at you know there's people like you and there's people like phil and i look at it, i look down the roster and, go, and there's so-and-so and there's so-and-so what am i doing here this is just insane um <laughs> you know yeah you, 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 <laughs> that's you, relatable you, yeah <laughs> you know, you know, that's, that, that's that thing of and i and and I've, 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 I, you know, for having this sort of chip on my shoulder, I, I in 2018, I got to do the, my first ever couple of academic conferences mm-hmm. where, you know, people are talking about folk horror and talking about, you know, and it's like, well, you know, uh, uh, there's no practitioners here. Um, right. Well, I, I need to go and represent the county. <laughs> and, 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 it, and so it was very strange going into universities and talking about Auckland mm-hmm. or seeing people talking about Auckland who are academics and going, well, this is just, this is quite odd, but it, it's just, I, I know I've, I've done a few gallery talks and I, and I, I will go anywhere. Anybody wants to talk about Auckland, I'm there because you know, I have to represent for the county, but um, it, it, I'm really looking forward to Avalon Con because I, 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 at a very personal level, I want to talk to you in the pub. Mm-hmm. There's other people I want to talk to in the pub. I just want to sit and natter and, 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 and until it's closing time. Um, yeah, and it's going to be the, the, fantastic. The, it's going to be fantastic, but it's also just you know to go in front of an audience and talk about this because I am, you know, I, 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 I it, it's very weird because you know you you live in your own sort of strange bubble as a writer, mm-hmm. and you do something like this, and 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 you, that you go and meet people and they they read you and they know what you're talking about and you can have conversations about the hum or stay belows and it's like this is this is not in all of my life writing books on true crime and conspiracies you never really got any interaction i never really did talks i never really ha- was able to have conversations with people mm-hmm. so it's just lovely to be able to do that and um so i'm really looking forward to have long con it's been a pleasure to be honest thank you very much i will happily come on anytime i really enjoyed it it's been you know you're a fabulous person to talk to oh, thank and you. um Likewise. Yeah, and, 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 and i'm sorry i'm not i haven't really got anything to sell i mean um you know, you got, well, you, uh, Hookland. Hookland. well yeah i mean, I mean come on Hookland. i have to, it's not really there's not really anything i can sell there i mean i say you know if you buy a copy of um rituals and decoration scene you'll get hookland pieces there and if you want to reread uh, i think the last three things i've written for written have actually been forwards for people so you know if you want to buy a book by phil hines uh, uh hines varieties because i've i've got a forward in that uh you, <laughs> you can buy um, my friend Andy, uh, who everybody will know from Folk Horror Revival, did a wonderful book um, about COVID. Uh, it's mm-hmm. full of his art and a wonderful essay. I did a forward for that, so buy that if you if you want to buy things. Um, and I've just done a forward for, as I said earlier, a guy called Alex Langstone, who I've known for years and years. Right. And it is a wonderful book on Essex folklore called Liminal Shore. And it was an honor to do a forward for that. But I'm like, yeah, yeah, just find me on Twitter, say hello. Mm-hmm. I'm relatively, I know I can be quite old and grumpy. And I, and I realize I am a bit of a curmudgeon. And when Phil sits on the sofa and we, you know, we're eating bread pudding and drinking tea and putting the world to rights, I do realize we are part of the curmudgeon club. But I, <laughs> I you know, come and say hello on Hawkland and I will be friendly. And I am, like, you know, it's, it's it's a point of the thing of it's a community mm-hmm. uh i you know i have to be in it and to be accessible and other people in the community if if if, if i can't answer a question somebody else will you know it, it, it the loveliest thing for me is that hawkland has become a, its own little community and mm-hmm. um, people do wonderful things in it it's very supportive uh it, there's not only a very you know anti-fascist re-enchantment is resistance stance but you know there's there's a, there's a stance against just general piss puff and in, in total so it's a nice friendly place come and say hello awesome. uh it, it may baffle you it may not be for you but it may be a place that haunts you it may be a place where you can walk across that ghost soil and tread on your own psychic line land line land tread on your own psychic landmines and sort of reconnect to your own terrors and your own enchantments and wonders and you know if you do, that's brilliant. It's working. And if it just baffles you, I apologize. That was not the intent. <laughs> David, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. And, no, uh, no, you it's been, been, been a joy. Thank you for having me. An absolute pleasure. Thank you.
What a fantastic show. I really, really enjoyed that. That was a fantastic conversation. Huge thanks to David for coming on the show, which I believe was his first ever podcast. So an internet first, I can lay claim to now. Fantastic. One thing I I think you can take away from, from this show, and indeed the show, uh, previous shows with Phil Hine, is there's going to be a really great standard of conversation and knowledge and just entertainment at Avalon Con. Um, so make sure you get your ticket and don't miss out and tickets are in the show notes. And uh, if you're going there, I look forward to meeting you. All right, let's leave it there. Take care. Bye.